again, Candace Moore from the Chicago Lawyers Committee. Um, I'm a senior staff attorney that works on education equity issues here in Chicago and in the surrounding areas. And so as I was thinking about this idea of how the law creates inequity and how we can use the law as a tool to uh, push for equity, um, I, I sort of settle on two examples. I'm going to try to tell them as fast as I possibly can, um, but they're very complex. It's very complex work, and it, t it has taken a long time. And um, I'm happy to answer more questions around it. But in my work, um, two big issues that I think many folks who understand education can sort of relate to and understand, the topic of school discipline and school closings. Um, so I want to talk about discipline briefly first, and so how there, when we look at uh, inequity created by the law. So here, I think it's really important when we're looking at school discipline, I think there, there can be a tendency to sort of point to individual bad actors and say, well, you know, this student's misbehaving, something's got to be done. Um, Candace, what, 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 you know, kind of what's the problem? Well, the problem when we look at it is that when we look at discipline uh, here in Chicago, here across Illinois, across the country, we see that uh, there are huge racial disparities uh, in, the, in, the, in the student populations that discipline the most, particularly African-American students in, in a lot of places, especially here in Chicago, and African-American boys. And so where, how is the law creating this, right? So here we look at policies like zero tolerance policies policies that are supposed to, or in theory supposed to be, you know, I don't care who's doing it, this is what's gonna happen. But the challenge is that the way that interacts with the way we've been socialized around behavior, around criminalization, we make choices all the time about who's more likely to misbehave, who am I watching, who am I really concerned with, who is most likely to continue on this kind of behavior. So even a policy like zero tolerance what ends up happening, it is used to support this idea, well, they did that thing and that's all that can be done. I can't do anything different. Whereas for other students, because that policy doesn't seem fair as applied, we make, we, we make different choices. We don't apply the policy in the same way. And so what we see is that the, these types of policies across the board contribute to uh, uh, a lot of disparities in terms of justifying the discipline of students of color, but at the same time, we know that students, uh, particularly white students, are doing the same things and not receiving the same punishment. Um, it, the, the behavior is being classified as something else. The other thing is, as we think about a society, how we respond to things like school closing, uh, school shootings, right? Uh, this is, these are very scary things that happen in schools, and often right after we see an immediate criminalization of our schools, right? We need to get police officers in there. We need to get security cameras in. But these things stay long beyond any particular incident, and often the mentality of criminalization, we are looking for crimes. We want to stop things before they happen often is over applied to students of color because of the way in which we imagine uh, criminality to happen. When we think about the term criminal, when we think about who is criminal, uh, many of us, uh, if, if we sort of close our eyes, a visual would pop up. And often when times we're talking about race, it is often a black person, a black male, because we're inundated in society with those images and those visuals, and those impact our judgment. And so the way the law interacts with the way we've been socialized creates these huge disparities in schools. Um, and so uh, that's sort of like the quick and fast version of that. Um, but then what, what can we even do about that? How can we use the law as a tool to begin to solve these things? So here in Illinois, um, and I really appreciate what you brought up about this can't only be the work of lawyers. It really does require us working in community, uh, communities of young people, young people who were directly impacted by this issue began to craft solutions. They first crafted solutions for their own school district. So here in CPS, about uh, four or five years ago, major overhauls in how we did discipline in, in the district. And it's caused um, a, a huge, uh, huge numbers of exclusionary discipline to go down. Um, those young people saw some of those wins and then went on to champion this piece of, a piece of legislation at the state level. And so now in Illinois, we have new statewide legislation um, sort of called SB 100. It's not a Senate bill anymore, uh, but everyone still calls it SB 100. That's ushering 
um, real accountability when, we, when it comes to discipline. Schools have to have standards about how they're making their di discipline decisions. Schools have to be accountable for the disparities. So right now in Illinois, over 80 schools have to commit uh, improvement plans for how they're going to deal with the fact that their school has been, promote, been pushing out uh, disparities at the at sort of the top categories of all schools for three years in a row. So these are reforms that are actually happening now that are meant to sort of curb what we've been seeing. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about just super briefly <laughs> uh, is school closing. So um, for folks who live in Chicago and many people who don't, we're familiar with the 50 school closings that happened in 2013, right? It was historical. Um, and the justification for those school closings uh, largely was, was sort of claiming that these schools were underperforming and they were underutilized. And because of population shifts, the district really needed to uh, uh, close these schools and really focus on investing um, in, in, in a smaller number of schools. But for many of the reasons, again, that you named around the ways in which society is stratified and resources exist, these schools were predominantly in African-American communities. And so the 50 school closings disproportionately impacted students of color. Uh, sort of fast forward to the summer of 2017, National Teachers Academy. How many people, just by a show of hands, have heard about this? I know one person is a parent at National Teachers Academy. Uh, National Teachers Academy is an elementary school. It's located really close to the South Loop, an amazing school. It is not underutilized. It is high performing. And in fact, it is performing at the uh, highest uh, rating that a school can get in Chicago public schools. Unfortunately, in the summer of 2017, the district decided to close that school. They decided to close that school. Oh, I should also add that that school serves 80% African American students. Um, which is really kind of unheard of when we think about the racial disparities around performance in the district. Uh, but the district decided to close this school uh, to turn it into a high school to meet the need of a really fast-growing neighborhood, the South Loop, um, one of the most affluent uh, neighborhoods in, in, in Chicago. And um, for many different reasons, everyone, many folks in the community saw this as racially unjust. Right? This, would this happen if this school did not serve 80% African American uh, uh, student population? In fact, there was, no, there was no history of CPS ever closing a school that had top ratings and, what, and this sort of utilization. So why was it happening? Why was it being allowed? What can we do? So when we think about solutions, I would again point to the fact that the first part of the solution was a community coming together to tell their story about the impact that this kind of closing would have. Um, showing up at every testimony, doing racial equity impact assessments and reports and submitting to, that, to the district. Unfortunately, the district decided to still close the school. And so that became a point where us as lawyers who were working with the community um, filed a lawsuit. Uh, we filed a, uh, a, a lawsuit that had five, five, um, five different claims, four under the, uh, that alleged violations of the Illinois school code, and one that alleged a violation of the Illinois Civil Ra Rights Act for racial discrimination. Um, to make a very, very long story short, uh, when we got to court this past December, uh, and we, we were pursuing a preliminary injunction, um, so when we got to court this uh, past December, we actually lost on four out of our five claims. All the claims uh, where we alleged violations under the Illinois school code, the only claim that we survived was the Illinois Civil Rights Act, right? And that was really important to us because uh, we were pushed to really craft a claim that went to the heart of the problem. Why was this a racially discriminatory decision? The way the district had made this, the way they made this decision would have uh, disproportionately impacted any school that had majority African American students. And so a lot of this was about having the courage to name that and to claim it and be honest about that, but to also tell the history of how we got here, to say that this wasn't a one-time you know, one scenario. And so um, that really sort of supported this lesson, this idea that when we, name, when we name it, when we frame these things, when we're honest about what's going on, we really can see solutions come coming out. And it was, uh, in fact, um, I think one of the things we learned is that this may have been the first time that uh, 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 a, a community was able to stop a school closings uh, using a race-based claim um, to stop a school closing. So it was really important to the community, but it really had a, a lot of importance for all of us that do this work. 
Yeah, one of the most...